Greetings, friends, and welcome. Wherever you're coming from and however you came to be with us today, it is my great pleasure and distinct honor to welcome you to Auburn Seminary's 26th Annual Lives of Commitment Celebration. We're gonna spend the next hour or so together celebrating women whose stories have broken chains and whose visions have healed communities. Women of moral courage, who've given of the substance of their lives to lead and nurture movements for justice. The Lives of Commitment celebration is about elevating women whose lives inspire us to join in the call to heal the world. Now, as we planned this celebration, we felt a deep longing to see you all in person. But because of the emergence of new virus variants and our collective assessments of the risks associated with public gatherings, we leaned instead into our commitment to safety. I'm excited to welcome all of you from wherever you're joining us and in whatever manner you're tuning in. Let me offer my thanks to the Lives of Commitment Celebration Committee for their partnership and collaboration and for helping us to make this celebration a time for connection and joy in challenging times. We need connection and joy in challenging times. Thank you to the Auburn team for the work that you do every day, but especially during these last two years of pandemic and transition, I'm honored to serve with you. And thank you all to my friend, Katherine Henderson, to all of Auburn's board members, friends, partners, and donors for your trust, your support, and for making our work possible. When I became president, last October, because I knew something about Auburn. I knew that this role would already feed the hope that I have about the world that I know is possible for all of us. I also knew that this role would require me to lead from a place of historical and contemporary complexity. But I'm leaning into that complexity with joy, and I'm excited about what will be unfolding in Auburn's new chapters. And there's a role for you to play in this continuing story. Imagine with us, share your hopes with us, journey with us. Along the way, we'll hold on to something old and familiar, the convictions of our founders who held that Auburn must never resort to narrow ecclesiasticism, selfish denominationalism, or an intolerant spirit. Let's overlay that founding tradition over the contours of this changing world that desperately needs our vision of a multi-faith, multi-racial, and just world to be vibrant and strong. The late Thich Nhat Hanh said that we live in a world that suffers from the delusion of separateness. And even after this leveling global pandemic, too many of us still believe that we don't need each other, but we do. I'm asking you to join us as we renew our connections, renew our sense of purpose, develop new capacities, and hold truth and meaning in new ways. We hold fast that all that has come before us, even the difficult times, has prepared Auburn Seminary for the moment we are about to meet, because that's who we are. We bring the best in us to meet the moment, and you are definitely a part of the best in us. Friends, I am inspired by this year's honorees, six incredible women whose power, vision, and talents are commitments to justice. It's my honor to share this stage with them and this time with you. Thank you for joining us today and for the work that you will do with us tomorrow to create a more just future for all of us. So let's turn our attention 
to a song from another time of transition. As the 1960s came to an end, the song Bridge Over Troubled Water was a healing balm. May the beautiful gifts of our beloveds from the Middle Collegiate Church Choir, Madge and Dion, be a bridge into a sacred space that honors our connections, a space where we can lay down our burdens and dream together. Auburn has always attracted, I think, staff, leaders, faithful folk with big imagination. People who refuse to accept no for an answer. I just want to give my gratitude for this new beginning on this day of Brachit, when we can come whole where we can bring our full selves, our spiritual selves, 
our religious selves, our full cultural and ethnic and racial and gendered selves to protest and to prayer. Auburn is accompanying leaders who are creating change and who are willing to work. And who are willing to provoke, to prod. The church absolutely has a role in this movement making. And it is our job to imagine the light even when we can't see it. It is our job. It is our job to turn pain into purpose, to turn pain into promise, and to turn pain into power. To dream and to create the opportunities, to create the circumstances, like to create the spaces for others to dream and to be supported. My faith tells me that I should live a beautiful, full life and do the best that I can for my family and for my people. And I don't think there's any faith that advises us something different than that. If you believe that a future is possible for all of us, a future of thriving, a future of peace, then join Auburn Seminary in this call to trouble the waters and heal the world. Hello, beloveds. My name is Lisa Anderson, Vice President of Embodied Justice Leadership here at Auburn. And today, I want to lead us in an activity inspired by the words of the legendary civil and human rights leader, Ms. Ella Josephine Baker. For those of you who don't know her, Ella Baker is a prolific, if largely behind the scenes activist for a large part of the 20th century. She is most well known for her work in the U.S. civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So many things distinguish her, but the one thing I want to celebrate about Ella that also connects her to each and every one of us is that Ella Baker believed in the power of human beings dreaming to change the world. In fact, she actually said the following of her own longing for a more just world. This may only be a dream of mine, but I know it can be made real. This may only be a dream of mine, but I know it can be made real. Imagine Ella uttering these words in the presence of her friends and co-conspirators more than half a century ago. As fire hoses were being turned on demonstrators, as little girls were being bombed in churches, as the Vietnam War raged, as marchers of every persuasion continued to march regardless of the violence they may have encountered, as all of this happened and more, Ella worked and Ella dreamed of freedom. Ella dreamed of justice. Ella dreamed of transformation. This may only be a dream of mine, she said, but I know it can be made real. Beloveds, our times are not so far removed from Ella's. As legislators come for our queer and trans babies, as we struggle to emerge from a pandemic that has left us numb by grief, as authoritarians make war and climate crises create refugees of our neighbors and friends, of us. What dreams for justice, freedom, and peace do you still dream? In these difficult days, when dreaming may feel like a luxury we cannot afford, what dreams do you still know can be made real? In a moment, I will hold a brief time of silence between us. And in that time, I invite you to answer this question for yourself. Feel whatever it is you long for. And during our quiet time, if you will, I invite you to share your dreams in the chat. What is that dream of yours that you know can be made real? Dream with me now, beloveds. Dream with me.
Thank you for your contributions. Our Auburn team is collecting your offerings and will share them with you in the coming days. And now, let us pray. Holy One, hold our dreams and inspire our actions to make them real. Bless our longings expressed in the chat or held in our hearts. May we dream and know. May we dream and know. May we be like Ella. Amen. I want to thank Auburn Seminary for this award and for the wonderful opportunity to be here today to tell you my story. Now, my story is about communities in crisis. It is about the national movement that has worked for the past 31 years to address the disproportionate impact of pollution in communities of color, indigenous, and low wealth. It is a story of hundreds of grassroots groups around the country whose activism has won local David and Goliath struggles and the passage of key environmental justice, health, and community development legislation across this country. Now, the work of this movement has galvanized my attention, admiration, and commitment for the past 34 years. This work has been the only support for hundreds of neighborhoods and communities on the front lines of pollution, racism, disinvestment, and environmental degradation. It is work that makes me smile when I walk through my community, walk 12 minutes from my home to my West Harlem office and to the West Harlem Pierce Park at 125th Street in the Hudson River, a park for which my organization, WE Act, mobilized hundreds of residents to name their vision for the waterfront, to design it, and then advocate to make it a reality. But I first came to this work as a political activist eager to create a new political pathway and consciousness in Harlem, where I lived. I worked with a group of committed and passionate senior ladies who told me it was my turn to mobilize a new political direction for West Harlem. The fight for a more progressive politics that was for and by the community became an initiative to bring the conditions of environmental justice communities to the agenda of New York City and state. Strategic partnerships have been key in addressing the sustainability of our neighborhoods. Now, our theory of change at WEACT is that we can build healthy, safe communities if we work with the most impacted people and engage them in environmental decision-making. I'm energized by the 100 Harlem members who we were able to get to come to the New York City Climate March, who had never, ever been involved in a protest or a demonstration and by the hundreds of grassroots residents and high school students who have graduated from WEAC's Environmental Health and Justice Leadership Training Program. There is not one day that I wake up that I'm not eager to make a difference and to be relevant to the places where we live, work, play, worship, and go to school. I am honored to have made a difference in my community and to work to ensure that others have the same access and opportunity. We cannot do this work alone. We need collective action. So I thank Auburn Seminary for acknowledging the body of work that I may represent, and by proxy, the work and lives of grassroots activists, both here and abroad. Thank you. is a culture of secrecy in California. I have some fear. What kind of repercussions will I get for coming on and talking about this? I've always been a fighter, but it wasn't truly birth until I was in prison. He did a pelvic exam. He said I had a fibroid. I was told that I had cancer cells. When I came out, I felt like something was wrong. We were getting hundreds of letters about medical abuses every month. It was the first time a doctor 
told you that you may be missing your ovaries? No one ever told me that. I had been intentionally sterilized, and I had been lied to. The law prohibits sterilizing people in prison for the purpose of birth control, but they were doing it anyway. One of the challenges with this story is you ultimately have to get to intent. And then that's when the doctor said, well, that's cheaper than welfare. I was looking at these documents that was confirming as a black woman, my life wasn't shit. I was very much intimidated by whom I was going up against. The state has admitted that they have done these illegal surgeries, but we don't actually know who they did them on. That means become numbers. You don't get names. And that's what makes it easy to abuse them. Women in California being coercively sterilized is absolutely revolting. After all this pain, I'll never be the same. We have yet to get an apology. We have yet to be acknowledged. The state has to be made accountable. Cause some wounds never heal. Do you see what you've done? When I began this journey of trying to find justice, at the time it was just me trying to fight for what happened to me. But then once I met Cynthia Chandler, I began to see that there was a bigger thing at play. And that not only was I being called to stand up and courage for myself, but then as I looked around at my sisters who were also being harmed, then I realized that it was just not about me. It was about me putting my life um, up as a sacrifice in order to make sure that these things doesn't happen to other people. There's moments in a person's life where when you are called to a purpose that's higher than yourself. I think that when someone is faced with this moment in time that you don't realize that it is courage. You don't realize that it's strength. You just realize that it's right. It's just the right thing to do. I sometimes I look back and say, what could I have done to, or what could I have done differently? But as I look forward in my life, I realize that everything happened for a reason. My life has been blessed by getting the chance to meet Cynthia, by getting to know Erica Cohen, and collectively coming together in order to just make a difference in the world. And I'm, I'm really honored that my life has been considered a life of commitment. It's been over 20 years in which I've been fighting for the rights of others and I'm just happy to receive this award. I was inspired to become an attorney because of the change I saw happening and that grassroots movements were able to create even in my lifetime. So my parents were young parents and they were young parents because it was illegal to access contraceptives. And I grew up in a segregated town where there was a juvenile facility where it was no accident that all the children caged there were black. And in my lifetime, I've seen some pretty miraculous changes. There's now remedies in the law that at least sometimes can effectuate justice around discrimination in the workplace and in education. And I got the privilege of working with a team, not just to make Belly of the Beast, but to make history by creating change in the law that makes California the first state to provide reparations for people who were sterilized in this current era in prisons. So I know that miraculous change can happen, but it's not made through miracles, 
it's happened through incredible organizing. And everything I've learned about courage and leadership, I've learned from people inside and the bravery and the dignity that they've shown me has been tremendous. And so I wanna thank you all for this honor and say that I hope we all move forward and continuing to make change. Thank you so much. I made my first film when I was 15, mentored by a youth media program in Salt Lake City in conjunction with the Sundance Institute. And at the time, I was really struggling with how to self-identify as a non-Mormon, coming from an interfaith family, Jewish and Lutheran, in a city where faith really defines who a person is. And film became a catalyst for me to express my frustrations with socio-cultural religious alienation and to really heal generational wounds as I first found the courage to turn my camera on my family and examine my own personal lens. After this experience, I became committed to providing a platform for unheard voices to be heard and untold stories to be told, then to use it as a tool to ultimately challenge injustice as we've done with Belly of the Beast. When I met Cynthia Chandler and Kelly Dillon over a decade ago, I learned about this different kind of genocide happening through mass incarceration and specifically through forced sterilizations behind bars. In collaboration with Folks Inside, we created a project that would ultimately become Belly of the Beast. A film that took over a decade to make, a film that demanded accountability, a film that created the political will for reparations for four sterilization survivors to pass in California. Thank you to Auburn for this very special recognition. I'm in awe of the powerful change makers who are being honored today. I'd like to thank my talented collaborators on Belly of the Beast for their vision, for their courage and brilliance in challenging imprisonment and state violence. And in particular today, Kelly Dillon and Cynthia Chandler, who are two of the most innovative and inspiring people I know. May this moment encourage us all to confront our heinous eugenics history and take a bold stand against the racist, sexist, and ableist practices that still perpetuate health inequities today and deny oppressed communities the right to have a future. Thank you again. So Lambent isn't our last names, but <laughs> Lambent is actually a quality of light. It's that type of light that flickers. It's the light that hits water and you get that brilliant sheen. And so from that type of magical light, that was the inspiration for us setting up Lambent Foundation. Um, it was the idea that artists and cultural practitioners um, and community coming together. I would say what inspires us is I ideally that lambent type of light. What draws our attention and we seek to see it over and over and yet we're looking for what is to also emerge. And we believe that the um, artist, art, aesthetic, artistic practice is that forward edge of healthy and vib vibrant communities. We are inspired by the artists and practitioners that we work with. We work in three different landscapes. They're all different. The ideas that flow out of them are forward thinking, innovative, and we are excited to work with them. Cultural practice is embedded in every community and in each landscape. Uh, when we say landscapes, we're speaking of the three cities. And so inherent into communities are culture. And so we are drawn by what is embedded in the daily fabric of communities and, and, and lives. And their histories. Their histories, the, the struggles, the connection with their lands. Their resiliency in the art and performance. And the belief that art and culture and aesthetics are valued. In all three landscapes, they are integral to the life and what we all think of as civic urban life. Lambent's history grew out of the Starry Night Fund. We were working together funding progressive movement building. And 
we had a great opportunity to meet incredible leaders, work with women's funds, work with other organizations that were putting out bold ideas and mobilizing people. And we did that for several years, probably 10 years. And then we took a moment to reflect, to see where we were, what, what had been moved in our field, and we took time to reflect. And we realized that the world was changing. It was a digital world now, and things were moving quickly, but there were still old problems. And we found ourselves drawn to the arts for, for questions. And that's where we decided to really focus uh, on looking at the intersection between art and justice, between artists and organizers, and there became the birth of Landman. One of our goals is to make sure our arts organizations are thriving so that they can play the important role that they do in, in our lives and in our cities, which is give us access to free expression. We consider free expression to be an existential matter. We're not gonna survive if we don't have that. We need people to keep imagining us into the future. We've been doing this work for two decades now, and that leadership isn't this one individual. It's not one charismatic individual. It's collectively held. Um, yes. Leadership is about uh, relationship. Leadership incorporates mutual accountability. It incorporates trust and vision. Leadership allows for a stumbling. It, it, inquire, it requires reflection and pause and listening. Thank you so very much to Auburn. Uh, this honor is uh, deeply cherished by Ann and myself and the full Lambent community. I've always appreciated Auburn because they nurture and bring together leaders that come from their a deep, authentic place um, with people who have been considering for a long time the complexity of the issues confronting us with the heart and soul and um, thoughtfulness that comes from a faith leader. And we have needed that for Lambin to be seen in this community is really meaningful. I think um, we will definitely tell our grantees to say that we have we have been seen by you and and seen by people who are deeply motivated by their commitment to putting justice and love and peace um, in the center of their work. Thank you, dear honorees, for your words and your graciousness in joining us today. For those of you who are new to the Lives of Commitment celebration, this ritual is a central practice each year. We're now going to offer each honoree a blessing with water. Many traditions use water in ritual practice, but the significance of water is not unique to a single faith. Like water, these blessings flow into the shape that each participant brings to their perspective. That complexity is at the heart of this ritual celebrating our honorees and our practice of connecting to many faiths and none. This year, Auburn staff members will voice each blessing. And as the water passes over the hands of the honorees, may you all be nourished as well. Peggy, guardian, organizer, maker of good trouble. Like the storied leaders whose legacies nourish our hope of a more just and liberatory future, you bore witness to the death-dealing forces threatening your community and gave your voice to their cause. You responded to your community's need for real action in the face of rampant environmental racism. For righteous anger expressed in practical action and demands and for an organized and cohesive force 
that truly holds the powerful to account. You co-created and are still co-creating the movement for environmental justice that has inspired action in every region of our country and across the world. As this water passes over your hands, we offer you this blessing. May your dedication to the health and dignity of frontline communities everywhere strengthen our resolve for the challenges ahead. And may you feel unmistakably the presence and fresh hope of every life lifted by your voice and work. Erica, Cynthia, Kelly, storytellers, activists, truth tellers, your film, Belly of the Beast, shone a light on your commitment to both writing the reproductive injustice you uncovered and filmed over seven years inside prison walls and to your advocacy as you waged a court battle against the California Department of Corrections that resulted in reparations. These efforts speak to your belief in the power of storytelling to strengthen justice movements and to your determination to address issues of inadequate access to health care sexual assault, and illegal sterilization that have targeted, incarcerated, and formerly incarcerated women. As this water passes over your hands, we offer you this blessing. May your passion for achieving gender and racial justice through activism and through your weaving of stories nurture your continuing efforts to achieve equity across diverse populations using legal, grassroots, and documentary tools as platforms. Platforms on which we honor you today. Anne and Michelle. Artists, visionaries, collaborators, dreamers. Your work fuels art-filled justice movements and honors the power of art and imagination to create a more just world. Your practice celebrates and uplifts the infinite glow, the lambent light of radical imagination in each of us. The way you work inspires us, centering arts and social justice, honoring ancestral traditions and landscapes, and building an ecosystem for collective transformation. You model what it looks like to build relationships grounded in trust, accountability, and commitment. As this water passes over your hands, we offer you this blessing. May your light shine ever brighter to inspire new generations of collective leadership. May your creativity flow like water that nourishes deep wells of inspiration and joy. Thank you to the Auburn team members for offering those beautiful blessings and honoring your connections to our beloved honorees. To the Lives of Commitment Celebration Committee members, thank you. To the Auburn Seminary Board, thank you. And we offer our deepest gratitude for the leadership of transitioning board members, Jeannie Blaustein, John Golieb, Nikki Tanner, and Melinda Wolf. A very special thank you to our board chair emeritus, Mark Hostetter, and to our board chair, Mary Byron, who will soon become emeritus. As I look ahead to the future that is yet emerging through the portals of this pandemic, I feel a sense of excitement, but also a deep responsibility. I am the first Black woman and the first non-Presbyterian to serve as president. The decision to call me, I believe, harkens back to Auburn's founding and the truth that drawing the circle wide around all religious expressions and none is in our DNA. I'm excited that we will soon experience another first at Auburn in the leadership of our incoming board chair, Prabhjot Singh, a member of the Sikh community. Pluralism at Auburn means that holding to our roots gives us grounded strength to celebrate our deep connections as human beings who yearn for justice and peace. I hope that you will keep dreaming, imagining, and collaborating with us for justice, for peace, and for healing. And I'm honored to invite you to dig deep within your own convictions and support Auburn Seminary with your resources, not just because we need you, 
but the world needs us together. On the screen, you're going to find a few ways that you can support Auburn. Help us to continue to fuel the multi-faith movement for justice. And thank you for celebrating with us today. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. No one stands alone, we'll stand side by side. Draw the circle, draw the circle wide. Draw the circle, draw 